But it's not just that, because the first thing the chick does when it hatches, and it has a shorter incubation time than the host species, generally speaking, the first thing it does is it's, it, it can hardly see it's this little featherless, scrawny little thing, is it pushes the eggs, the other eggs out. Why? Well, to maximize its own return. And I'm going to show you. Uh, what I was going to show you was a little, a little video clip which shows this action with a, 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 a thrush's nest and, and you see the thrush sitting on the eggs and boop, boop, the eggs start being pushed out of the nest onto the ground uh, uh, by, the, by the little cuckoo chick. Uh, there is absolutely no mistaking this. This is, this is purpose of behavior. And the reason why is also very clear. This is, not, this is not a fluke. This is not an accident. This is what cuckoo chicks do. You will be maybe relieved to recognize that the cuckoo chick doesn't know what it's doing. <laughs> it knows not the, what should we call it, ovicide that it is committing. Uh, <laughs> But it is the beneficiary of this behavior that is nicely wired into it. Well now, how can these be the reasons if no reasoner thought them up? Well, I want to just walk very slowly through this. Natural selection is what you might call an automatic reason finder. The process blindly discovers, endorses, and focuses reasons over many generations. Here's how it goes. Consider a population with a lot of variation in it. Okay, some do well, some don't. Every generation, some do well, some don't. In each case, we can ask of any one individual, why did it do better? And sometimes the answer would be no reason. It just happened, you know, it was lucky or it was unlucky. It got run over by a bus, uh, hit by lightning, or uh, just happened to be in the right place when all the food was there or when the food wasn't there, whatever. In many cases, the answer is no reason, just luck. But if there's a subset, perhaps very small, of cases where there is an answer to this question, not that anybody in nature is asking it, then what the cases have in common provides the germ of a reason. And this is what natural selection then promotes, in effect, amplifies, discovers, endorses. So what happens is that natural selection tracks reasons, creating things that have purposes, but that don't need to know them, like the cuckoo chick. In espionage, we have the famous need to know principle. In the case of the CIA uh, and uh, 007, the idea is that if an agent doesn't know something, he can't spill it if you ever waterboard him. So the idea is that agents should know as little as possible about the circumstances and purposes of what they're up to so that, so that they can't give it away to the enemy. That's one reason for the need to know principle, but in biology it's much simpler, it's just thrift. If an organism doesn't need to know why this is a good thing to do, it won't. It'll just be wired up to do it and be the beneficiary without knowing why. And of course, this is true of natural selection itself. It doesn't need to know what it's doing. That was Darwin's great discovery. And notice how much it is like Turing. The computer doesn't need to know what it's, how, why it's doing what it's doing. It just has to have the confidence. Now, there's a common error that needs to be pointed out at this point, and that is that when we see some clever animal, say, doing something very, very, very purposeful, we're inclined to attribute much more understanding to the agent than need be. It's a very natural tendency, and I think the explanation for this is simple. We just don't have the language, we don't have the terms in everyday speech for talking about what we're actually observing, which is, if you like, semi-understood quasi-representations, or even hemi-semi-demi-understood pseudo-representations. You'll notice that there is no, I, I dare say there's no term in Norwegian either, no simple term for this. 
But that notice is exactly what Turing provides. That's what computer science provides. Wonderful examples by the thousand of what you might call hemi semi demi understood pseudo representations built up to do more and more and more. Now, sometimes birds do things where you think there's a lot more understanding, and I dare say if we can run this one. Aha, so far, so good. There's no soundtrack with this. Watch this crow. Oh, it's got a wire and it's got some food down there, but it can't get the food at the bottom of the beaker. Oh, it tries and it tries. No luck. That gives up. No, it doesn't. Look what it does. that bird a hand, yes. Uh, clearly more insightful than the cuckoo chick. But actually, uh, I hate to disappoint you, but, but that crow has seen hooks before, has been given hooks before. It's not quite as, this is not Einstein. <laughs> this is still not as clever as you might initially be inclined to think. Um, All right, I've looked at amoebas, caddisflies, and some birds. Now we leap ahead to one species, our species, just 10,000 years ago. This is at the dawn of agriculture, shortly after the dawn of agriculture. Paul McCready, the late wonderful Paul McCready, made this calculation. He calculated that at that time, if you put all the living human beings on one side of the scale, together with their pets and livestock, and weighed them against all the terrestrial vertebrate biomass, that is all the animals, not, not the insects or the worms and not the fish in the sea, but just the animals, that the human beings plus their, their livestock would amount to less than a percent of the total. Well, that was 10,000 years ago. What do you suppose that percentage is today? The percentage that human beings, their livestock and pets make of the terrestrial vertebrate biomass. Any, any guesses? It's more, certainly. Hmm? 60. 60. 60%. Do I hear any advance on 60? It's like an auction. 98%. 98%. That is an amazing biological change in a very short time. Just stunning. We have engulfed the world. Here's what McCready says about it. Over billions of years on a unique sphere, chance has painted a thin covering of life. Complex, improbable, wonderful, and fragile. Suddenly, we humans have grown in population, technology, and intelligence to a position of terrible power. We now wield the paintbrush. So we want to understand how that came about, that technology and intelligence. Wonderful book by John Maynard Smith, uh, the mentor of our host today, uh, and Earth Zathmary, The Major Transitions of Evolution. In that book, they describe a series of sort of great moments in evolutionary history where, where some new, newly evolved development really changed the game. And they list the eukaryotic revolution, sex, multicellularity, and language and human culture among the great major transitions. Now, I'm going to briefly review the first of these, the eukaryotic revolution, because it bears a striking similarity to the one that explains what we might call the McCready explosion. 